Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 10 a.m. education program on this beautiful Tuesday morning. My name is Rachel, education specialist here at the Topeka Zoo, and today we are going to be talking about fourth grade curriculum relating to structures in birds, although as always, these classes are really for everyone. So last week when we talked about fourth grade curriculum, we talked about the internal and external structures that allow mammals to survive. Well today, we're going to do the same thing, although we're going to talk about the internal and external structures that allow birds to survive. And we'll talk a little bit about how they are similar to and different from the mammals. So the first thing that you notice about any bird in the world is their body covering. Birds are covered in feathers all over their body. And the color and the size of the feather just depends on where the bird lives and how it survives. Some birds, like macaws, which are a type of parrot, have these beautiful red and blue and yellow feathers as a way to attract a mate. Other birds, like flamingos, have bright pink feathers, and that comes from the shrimp and the foods that they eat. Other birds, like vultures and eagles, they have black and earthy colored feathers that allow them to camouflage or blend in with their environment. So the color and shape and size of feathers is different for each unique bird, but every bird in the world has feathers. Now another interesting aspect of feathers two layers of feathers. They have these beautiful outer layers that allow them to fly, if they do, and allow them to um, repel water and to camouflage or attract a mate. But birds also have a second layer of feathers underneath their outer ones. These are called down feathers, and these are small feathers that are on the inside of the bigger feathers, and they allow them to stay warm. You might have heard of a down feather coat or a down feather blanket. That is filled with all of these small, fuzzy looking feathers that allow the birds to stay warm. Now that is another characteristic of birds. Like mammals, birds are warm blooded. And what that means is birds, they produce their own body heat. They are able to keep the temperature inside their body constant at all times. Cold-blooded animals like reptiles and amphibians, they have to get their heat from an outside source, the sun or the water or a heating lamp. But the two warm-blooded animal groups, mammals and birds, they produce their own body heat and their body temperature stays the same. Now, interestingly, if we're talking about internal structures, both mammals and birds have four chambered hearts. And what that means is there are four chambers inside each of their hearts. Cold-blooded animals like reptiles and amphibians, they have three chambered hearts and fish have two chambered hearts. And the reason mammals and birds have more chambers in their hearts is because that allows them the energy that they need to produce their own body heat. So because they are warm blooded, mammals and birds have those four chambered hearts, which I think is a pretty cool adaptation if you're talking about the insides of these animals. Aside from feathers, every bird in the world also has a beak or a bill on their face. Now the size and shape of these are different for each bird and what they eat. Birds like geese, who aren't going to be major predators, have small flat-like beaks. Other types of birds who live in the water, like a spoonbill, has a similar shaped beak, although it kind of looks like a spoon on the end. And they use that for filtering out the water to get through to a lot of the invertebrates, the aquatic types of small animals like crustaceans. Owls and other birds of prey, their beaks are more hooked downward and that allows them to bite off chunks of their prey. But every bird in the world has feathers and they have a beak. Now going along with their beak, 
They also have feet or talons that are also adapted to where they live. So animals like geese and ducks who live in the water, they have webbed feet and not very sharp claws. Whereas birds of prey, like our owls and our hawks and our eagles, they have talons. These are specially modified for catching and killing other animals. So the beaks and the claws are adapted for each individual bird species. Every bird in the world also has wings. Now, not every bird has the ability to fly. Some birds, like ostriches or penguins, they don't fly. But every bird in the world does also have wings, and that allows them to propel themselves on land or in the water, or if they're a flying bird, to be able to fly as well. Some birds, like ostriches, actually use their wings as a way to attract a mate. They do a silly dance, which I think is really fun to watch. Now, every bird in the world, like mammals, are also vertebrates. And if you remember from last week, a vertebrate is an animal who has their bones inside their body. They have a backbone and an endoskeleton, which means inside are where your bones are located. Now, humans, our neck bones are about this size medium sized and birds just depending on their size they're mostly going to be smaller than humans but what's interesting is that some birds actually have hollow bones now the reason they have those hollow bones is because it helps them to breathe both mammals and birds have lungs However, mammals have a muscle called a diaphragm, and that allows them to help the air go in and out of their lungs. It allows the lungs to expand when we breathe in. So all mammals have a diaphragm and lungs that allow them to breathe. Birds also have lungs. However, they do not have a diaphragm. They actually have air sacs that extend into these hollow bones that allow them to, to breathe. That allows the oxygen rich air to go in and out of their body really efficiently. Now, not all birds have hollow bones. It's mostly the ones that fly. And that is so the air sacs can allow them to breathe and to fly really, really easily. So all birds have feathers. They are warm blooded. They are vertebrates. They breathe through lungs and they lay eggs. So again, just like the feathers and the beaks and the talons, eggs are adapted to each unique bird. Depending on how large or small they are, that is how large or small their eggs are. So this small egg is the egg of a screech owl. However, bigger birds, like ostriches, they lay really big eggs. Screech owls are gonna lay their eggs in the trees. Whereas ostriches, who don't fly, they have to have bigger eggs so that they can lay them on the ground, and they're so hard that predators can't actually break through them, even on the ground. Sometimes, the color of the eggs is different. Does anybody know what bird this belongs to? Much like the ostrich, it is a bird that does not fly, so it is bigger. This egg is not as thick as the ostrich egg, but you'll notice it's a different color. That is because this dark color allows it to blend into the ground. If you guessed emu, you are right. Emus have these beautiful dark colored eggs. So my friends, there are between 9,000 and 18,000 species of birds in the world. Scientists are studying them all across the United States, across our hemisphere, across the globe. Birds are some pretty unique animals and they can get really, really big. So if you ever find a bird in the wild and it needs help, please do help it. And always remember, the zoo is a resource. So if you ever have any bird questions, you can give us a call. So what we're going to do next is we are going to meet the bird that this 
toe belongs to. This is the toe, the bones, of a very big bird. And I am going to introduce you to Joe. He is the keeper of this bird. It is an ostrich. And he is going to talk about our two Topeka Zoo ostriches. So welcome, Joe. Hey, Rachel. Hello. So as Rachel mentioned, I take care of the ostriches here. And behind me, you can see one of our ostriches. That's red. Uh, he is our male ostrich. And on the other side of the yard, or a little bit farther that way, is purple, our female ostrich. And they're kind of moving around, grazing, looking for all the food that I have scattered around for them. Um, you can right off the bat see, well, maybe when purple moves from behind the tree, uh, that there's some pretty big color differences that can let you tell the difference between male and female. Red, our male ostrich, has really dark feathers, almost black looking, with really bright white at the end of his wings kind of like a white uh, collar of feathers around his neck. Whereas purple, our female, is more tan or light brown color. Uh, she's also a little bit smaller, which is typical. Male ostriches are a little bit bigger than the female ostriches. Um, one of the interesting things about their color difference, uh, the females typically lay on the eggs, incubate the eggs during the day. So that color pattern actually helps them camouflage and blend in with the ground to hide them from potential predators while they have a nest. Whereas the males tend to lay on the eggs and incubate the eggs at night. So those dark colored feathers actually help them disappear and blend in in the darker uh, conditions of night. So it helps keep their nest sites a little bit safer. And then after the eggs hatch, it's actually the male ostriches that do pretty much all of the care and rearing of the young ostriches, uh, helping keep them safe from predators uh, while they grow and get big enough to hopefully be safe from predators. Um, as adults, they're so fast and they have very good vision and hearing that they're, they're pretty good at evading predators, uh, like lions or jackals or leopards or cheetahs. But while they're young and growing, they are definitely vulnerable to predators, so they do need uh, some parental care to help them keep them safe from that. Wonderful. Right, oh. right now, Purple is actually pecking at a feeder because there is some food in there for her, and they know that if they peck it, uh, food will come out and they can get it. So, Joe, how fast do they run? Uh, they can run over 40 miles an hour. Uh, they are actually the fastest animal with two, two legs in the world. So it's pretty impressive. And how long does it take them to get to this big of a size? How tall are they now? So the male red, as best as I can tell, when he stands fully uh, straight up with his neck fully extended, I think he's getting close to about a little bit over eight feet tall. Um, they grow incredibly fast. So when they, these ostriches are about two, almost two years old. So they're actually still very young. They're not full grown until they're two to four years old. Um, but when they arrived here about a mm, little over a year and a half ago, they were just about three feet tall. So in a year and a half, they've gone from about three feet tall to red being about eight feet tall. And purple, she's, she's probably close to seven feet tall. That's wonderful. And can you talk a little bit about how they defend themselves in the wild? What part of their body you really have to watch out for? Uh, so they, if they are threatened by a predator and they are cornered and they can't run away, what they will do is they'll actually kick. And they have a really big claw on their big toe, which Rachel held that up earlier. Uh, this is pretty dull, and it actually primarily helps them get traction when they're running. Because they run so fast, they do need something to help dig into the ground so they don't just go skidding off the tracks when they run. Uh, but they will kick with this, and even though this is not very sharp, the force of their kick can do some pretty serious damage, and then it could kill a lot of their predators if they caught them just right. So they will, they will kick when they're threatened. And, and it's very fast, it's very fast. I've seen it a few times. Uh, they've not kicked at me, but I've seen them just get startled by a noise in the background and they'll just jump up and kick out and it is shockingly fast. And how many eggs do they lay at a time? So when you have an ostrich group, multiple females will lay eggs and they'll have sort of a communal nest, but the dominant female will actually lay first and she'll lay the most eggs and she will actually decide what eggs get kept because she will kick out uh, other females' eggs. Uh, at her discretion, how she decides, that's a good question, I don't know. But she might lay anywhere from seven to 10 eggs or so, but as a group, they might have 40 or 50 eggs uh, 
in, in a, kind of a communal nest. And how many live in a group? Uh, it can vary quite a bit, um, but you might have smaller groups of 10 or more and then maybe even groups of 30 or 40. Uh, there's, you know, a, a group of, of females that tend to hang out together and then a lot of males that might lurk around the edges to keep as many females close to them as they can uh, to try to have a better chance for, for mating. And can you talk a little bit about where they live in the wild? So they live uh, throughout a pretty wide stretch of Central Africa going down to Southern Africa, um, mostly Sub-Saharan going down to South Africa. And you were showing feathers earlier, which kind of I like to talk about too. Uh, usually people think about ostriches living in hot places, which is very true. They do live in hot places, but they live in places that are dry. And dry places are very cold at night. So they actually have a lot of downy insulative feathers that actually have to help, help keep them warm at night because it can get very cold in a lot of these, these regions at night. Uh, because they don't have to have feathers modified for flight, their feathers pretty much serve the purposes of providing color. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, the males have a very different color from the female. And then beneath those feathers, uh, they have the insulative downy feathers to help keep them warm. Very cool. And don't they have really large eyes? They have huge eyes and they have very good vision, which helps them keep a lookout for predators. Uh, there's kind of a, uh, like just a legend that ostriches, when they're scared, they bury their head in the sand. Uh, they do not do that because then they wouldn't be able to see. Uh, what they actually do is if they feel threatened, they will oftentimes just lay down and try to camouflage, but they'll actually lay their head down low to the ground so if you see the outline of their body, sometimes it looks like their head and their ne neck is gone. So it almost looks like their head stuck underground. I think that's kind of how, uh, plus they also will use their head to turn their eggs where they have their eggs kind of buried. And I think that kind of led to the legend that they stick their head in the ground, but they really don't. Uh, they definitely keep their head above ground all the time so they can look out for predators and for food to eat because they will eat different kinds of vegetation, but they will also eat snakes, little lizards, uh, small rodents that just go zipping by, uh, pretty much anything that they can swallow that catches their attention, they might try to grab any. Huh. You don't really think of ostriches as predators, but... Yeah, if, if a small snake goes by or uh, some insects, especially when they're younger, or a mouse, they might just snatch it up and swallow it. Wonderful. So just real quick, I want to give you guys the fourth grade worksheet for today, and then we will answer some of your questions for Joe relating to the ostriches. So if you are in fourth grade, what I want you guys to do linked in this video is a worksheet, and it talks all about the differing structures that both mammals and birds have. So down at the bottom, there are some words and phrases that I want you all to place in the correct category. Is it just mammals? Is it just birds or is it mammals and birds? Once you complete this, take a picture and show us everything you've learned about the structures and birds and how they use these structures to grow, to survive, to reproduce, and to meet all of their needs. So that is the end of our fourth grade lesson today, but let's answer some of your questions at home. I know everybody loves the ostriches. I did see one question, Joe. Um, we know they don't fly. Can they swim? Um, I don't believe that they would probably be able to swim. Uh, I don't know for sure, but because of their height, if they needed to cross a river, they could probably get through it. Um, they don't have a lot of surface area on their feet to kick. So I, I doubt they could do it very well because ducks and a lot of your water birds, if you look at their feet, they have that webbing to give them more surface area that they can push the water and paddle. And I, uh, yeah, here's a good example. They can use these to really push the water. Uh, kind of why people wear flippers sometimes when they go swimming, it helps, helps you swim a lot better. Um, but that is a good question. I don't necessarily think that they could, but I honestly don't know. And what do we feed them here at the Topeka Zoo? Somebody asked if they eat rats. Uh, I, they do not eat rats that I feed them. Um, they, they get a very wide variety of fruits and vegetables. And then we actually have a grain that is specific to ratites, which are a group of birds uh, comprising ostriches and rheas. Uh, and it is a grain just made for them and they love it. Uh, they also get some insects that I feed them, um, corn, some things like that. Excellent. And how do they get their names? I know their names are red and purple. Ah, so the reason I named them that was when they were very young, they were almost indistinguishable from each other. So uh, like 
all other birds at zoos, we put a band on their legs and the bands that I used were red and purple and I never got more creative than that. So it just kind of stuck. Red just stayed red and purple just became purple. Uh, they actually still have some bands on their legs. Uh, we don't really need them to identify them because you can really see the difference in plumage between males and females. But uh, I guess the short answer is I just never got very creative. I just liked red and purple. I think it's fun. We don't have any other color named animals here, so it's it's unique in that, right? So you talked a little bit about the enrichment of the food feeder over there. What other types of enrichment do you do for these large birds? So some ostriches get really into things on the ground and they might uh, interact with that. These ostriches, I've never gotten them to pay much attention to any objects on the ground. So I'm always trying to make and uh, build different types of feeders and things that I can suspend in the air because they have really picked up on the fact that if I put something out for them, it's food related and they will peck at it and investigate it. So I just hang up a lot of different things that uh, visually look different that they can peck and interact with. Mm -hmm. Most of which involve getting food out of it in some way. I'm pretty food motivated myself. Yeah, I can appreciate that. So will these ostriches have any babies? Have any uh, eggs? Uh, they're still very young. Purple, um, like I mentioned, they're not quite two. Uh, two years old is, is roughly when uh, female ostriches do reach the point that they can start laying eggs. Male ostriches, it's usually more like four to five years. Uh, that does vary by individual. Uh, so most likely red, our male, will not be ready to have babies for a year or two. Uh, but purple could start laying eggs just on her own uh, and probably will within the next few months, most likely. Um, and one interesting thing about their eggs, actually, I, but earlier you mentioned how thick they are, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that thick uh, buildup on those eggs not only helps protect from potential predators, but ostriches can be pretty clumsy. They can walk around, they can knock their eggs over, and they can potentially, potentially break them. So essentially, a healthier ostrich will be able to produce more calcium to make a thicker, healthier egg. So by doing that, that actually kind of ensures that healthier ostriches are the ones that reproduce because if you have an ostrich that's not eating very well or isn't very, very healthy, her eggs might not be very strong and very likely they won't, those eggs won't survive the incubation period to hatch because their walls are, are thinner. So. And I know these birds can live quite a long time. What's their lifespan? So they can live uh, 40 years on up to maybe even about 60 years. They do have a very long lifespan. They get uh, to full size usually in about between a year and a half to two years, uh, more or less. Um, so most of they're not they're not young or not not small very long, which helps them uh, be safer from predators by getting bigger and faster. So most of their life they are big and strong like this. Excellent. Well, does anybody at home have any final questions? I believe we've answered all of the ones so far. And while we're waiting on those final questions, um, I just want to let you guys know that tomorrow is fifth grade curriculum relating to interdependent relationships, which basically means we're going to talk about relationships that aren't just predator prey tomorrow. So things like invasive species, symbiosis, and all sorts of fun, interesting ways that animals interact with each other in the wild. So it looks like we don't have any more questions. So Joe, thank you so much for teaching us about our beautiful ostriches at the Topeka Zoo. Everyone at home, thank you guys for watching and we'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, here at the Topeka Zoo. Thank you.